Andrew Carnegie is a bit of a git, isn't he? If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen and ring the notification bell to be told when I upload new videos. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Andrew Carnegie is a name that I remember from early childhood. It felt like it rang hourly from the clapper tongue of one of the ants who brought us up. As a sensible, level-headed, grounded adult who watched every penny when Saturday brought the sight of something tasty in a toy or a sweet shop or some other extravagance, we'd hear the phrase, Who do you think I am? Andrew Carnegie! That's how I learned Andrew Carnegie's name. Rich beyond dreams, and yet the barrier between me and things out of reach. As I grew, I understood the story told here. The simple Scottish laddie that had gone to America, scraped an existence and then prospered, become a millionaire industrialist who came back and showered his beneficence in the old country. Here in Dunfermline, he funded the first municipal baths, a library and a precious jewel that I'm going to show you later. And of course, this week, I'll perform a stand-up show, Stories of Scotland, in Carnegie Hall. Not the second-rate New York one. But don't worry, I'll be coming across the Atlantic in 2024. I'll be bringing my show, Stories of Scotland, to Toronto, Halifax, Annapolis, New Glasgow, Moncton, Perth. That's right, there's one in Ontario as well. Ottawa, Fergus, Calgary, Vancouver, Victoria and more. There'll be a link top right or in the description below as always. It's a perfect Christmas gift. I learned about the gifts of generosity successful capitalists made to the poor. And then I reached adulthood. And as a young man, I discovered he was a bit of a git really. Don't get me wrong, he was a bright, willing, hard-working, energetic, can-do young laddie with initiative who went to America poor and through his efforts became the richest man in the world. He worked his way up from textile labourer to note-taker to messenger to telegraph operator to railway clerk, manager, shareholder, oilman, steelmaker, bond dealer and multifaceted multi-millionaire industrialist, writer, intellectual and patron of the arts. And I'll never cover everything in this video, but you'll learn so much more by visiting his birthplace museum here. You should go. What they might not tell you is, it was a bit of a get. It was his union breaking activities that made me think that. Maintaining or increasing profits by forcing men to take reduced wages and longer hours, denying them group representation, bringing in scab labour and even gun-toting Pinkertons to ensure compliance. Ordinary, hard-working men looked up, begging not to have their day extended from 8 hours to 12 hours, only to hear the response. Who do you think I am? Andrew Carnegie! The worst of these events was at a plant called Homestead near Pittsburgh, where the use of armed Pinkertons led to bloodshed and death on both sides. But at least the widows, orphans and downtrodden workers got a library. Now I'm an older man, maybe mellowed by years. But I recently read two biographies of Carnegie, and it's easier to be balanced with two. Carnegie's autobiography reveals something more than the hard-nosed industrialist who put working men in the streets and cut the wages of others to make him the richest man in the world. He was cheerful, optimistic, a warm, down-to-earth Scotsman who became an abolitionist American and a beneficent paternalist employer, always on good terms with his staff. Carnegie talks of growing up here in Dunfermline, around the Abbey. He was born shortly after the Abbey church was built. 
with Robert the Bruce buried under its pulpit and towering over the town. He tells how his real hero was William Wallace, the patriot who endured all, uncompromising. Struggling as a poor boy in America, at times he forced himself to keep going, asking, what would William Wallace have done? When it comes to that bloodbath at the Homestead plant that turned me against Carnegie, he explains that he was home in Scotland at the time. Had he only been there, he could have done something. And to be fair to Carnegie, his approach was always to starve the men back to work rather than do battle with them. Hadn't William Wallace preferred scorched earth and skirmishing to open battle? Here's what's strange to me. As Andrew Carnegie grew up in a nearby cottage, it was in a family of chartists. His grandfather and his uncles campaigned for and were persecuted on behalf of universal suffrage and the working man. His dad was put out of business as a weaver with the approach of the industrialisation that Carnegie would continue with ruthless efficiency as he put others out of work. The biography by David Nassau is more dispassionate and analytical than Carnegie's own. They both speak of his chartist background, but Carnegie spoke of his affinity with the working man. Whilst Nassau quotes from private letters and telegrams available after his death that reveal as hard-nosed an industrialist as any of the landed class against whom his Chartist family campaigned. It lists a litany of insider dealing, underhanded price fixing, political bravery to get contracts, corruption and crony capitalism. Some things that are now illegal at the time, were just best kept quiet. But another thing that Nassau's later access to papers tells us is something that happened when Carnegie was 33. He realised at that time that if he caught Carney in a couple of years, he'd never need to earn any money again. The yield from what he had would keep him for the rest of his life. Any more wealth could be used for the wider good. He wrote this in a note to himself that was never revealed before his death. It shows the genesis of his philanthropy. And to be honest, it speaks well of him. Of course, that was before he got married, bought an extended Skibo castle here in Scotland and a Scots baronial mansion back in the US. It was before his involvement in the brutal and fatal Union crushing activities. He continued to amass wealth and political influence to make more. But here's a thing. Eventually, his gospel of wealth declared that it was the duty of capitalists to give away their gains. The thud of fainting robber barns and the cries of socialist rang louder than the clapper bell from my aunt's lips. Who do you think we are? Andrew Carnegie! He did give away his wealth. Would I? Will you? It's unlikely that any of the folks watching this, and certainly not the presenter, will ever have the intellect talent, insight, foresight or business acumen to ever come anywhere close to what Andrew Carnegie achieved in business. But I bet every one of us can look back to something selfish or shameful that we've done that we shouldn't. Many of us might proclaim the good that we would do if we only had the money but few of us are called upon to demonstrate the veracity of our words. That got me thinking. I remember the UK Chancellor who engineered austerity speechifying about social security scroungers who lived off the backs of others, lying in bed as you and I head out to work to pay for their leisure. It was a rallying call from a privately educated son of a baronet to the ordinary worker. In Carnegie's autobiography, 
He tells of the thrill when he got his first dividend check. It was a light bulb moment for him. I shall remember that check as long as I live. It gave me the first penny of revenue from capital, something that I hadn't worked for with the sweat of my own brow. Eureka, I cried. Here's the goose that lays the golden eggs. When you consider that most of his life's work was done by others in steel mills as he travelled the world and enjoyed more leisurely pursuits, you realise that nobility and capitalists have much more in common with dole scroungers than the majority of us in the middle. The stock from which he obtained these first dividends were in a business called Adams Express. They were a document delivery service who, in return for a backhander to young Andrew Carnegie's boss, got an exclusive deal with his employer, the Pennsylvania Railroad. Since young Andy was a telegraph operator and knew every message coming in and out of the office, he got a little piece of the action. This under-the-counter trade was just the beginning. Effective altruism. It's a philosophy that can be simplistically summarised as is it better to spend years training to be a doctor than going to work in a poverty-stricken country or to make so much money that you can train a hundred doctors and pay them to go and work there? Making as much money as possible and giving it away, even if you have to step on a few toes and cut a few corners to do it, is justified by the greater good that you achieve. Seems like the kind of thing that Carnegie would have said. Now, a crypto billionaire called Sam Bankman Fried believed in this philosophy, and in 2022, Following the collapse of his cryptocurrency exchange and his attempts to keep it afloat with depositors' money, Bankman Freed was arrested and is currently facing life in prison. Now, if some of the laws that are in place today had existed in Carnegie's time, Is it better for one person to accumulate wealth and make magnanimous and judicious decisions about its distribution? Or should wealth be spread more evenly and people make their own decisions? How much of our wealth or income should we give to charity? If charity begins at home, who's welcome in your house? Given their tax breaks, what should be defined as charities anyway? Veterans groups? Libraries? Cat and dog homes? Private schools? Why does our tax system tax income that you work for more heavily than wealth that you don't? If Andrew Carnegie had done the first part of accumulating without the second part of distribution, would we even know his name? Are our donations to charity just to make us feel important? By all means, let me know what you think in the comments below. Also, visit the Carnegie Birthplace Museum in this wonderful park that features in a story from Carnegie's autobiography. You see, in 1902, Andrew Carnegie bought the Pitt and Creef estate and gave it and a big bag of cash to the people of Dunfermline. And they benefit from both to this day. In his book, he says, no gift I have made or can ever make can possibly approach that of Pitt and Creef Glen. Among my earliest recollections of the struggles of Dunfermline to obtain the rights of the town to the part of the abbey, grounds and the palace ruins. My grandfather Morrison began the campaign, or at least was one of those who did. The struggle was continued by my uncles Lauder and Morrison, the latter honoured by being charged with having incited and led a band of men to tear down a certain wall. The citizens won a victory in the highest court. And then the laird ordered that thereafter no Morrison be admitted to the Glen. I, being a Morrison, was debarred. It's laird was to us children the embodiment of rank and wealth. My uncle Lauder predicted many things for me when I became a man. 
But had he foretold that someday I should be rich enough and so supremely fortunate as to become Laird of Pitt and Creef, he might have turned my head. And then to be able to hand it over to Dunfermline as a public park, my paradise of childhood, not for a crown would I barter that privilege. I don't know how romanticised Carnegie's account is, but imagine it was you in your hometown. From people being locked out, his contribution meant that this wonderful place in the heart of Dunfermline has three quarters of a million visitors each year. Maybe some of them are descended from the striking workers killed during the Homestead Industrial Dispute in 1892. Another person born in this park changed America's history. I made a video about that and it's coming up on screen now. Support the channel by clicking top right to become a Patreon member or buy me a coffee in the description below. I mean, Doc is going to be a lot of my life. Sherry and Rasta.